Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, CBC News confirms new details about the scathing report that led to Julie Payette's unprecedented resignation. Why didn't your government ask some pretty basic questions? We are looking right now at processes that can be strengthened as we move forward. Tonight, the political and financial cost of the Governor General. Also tonight, BC lays out a detailed plan for vaccinating everyone. Plus, morning a baseball legend. The pitch by Downing, swinging. There's a drive into left center field. That he broke records and barriers. And a virtual standing O. A nine-year-old joins an online challenge and blows away the pros. This is The National. We have more details for you tonight about the investigation that led Governor General Julie Payette to resign, how it played out, and how much it's costing you. CBC News reported six months ago on the allegations of a toxic workplace. Staff subjected to scorn and ridicule, some who left jobs they once felt privileged to have. Claims now contained in a damning report we told you about last night. An important task still lies ahead, choosing the next Governor General. Ashley Burke has more tonight on a story she's been pushing forward, asking the Prime Minister how that selection will be made. And as you'll hear, he has no real answer and offered no remorse over his choice of Julie Payette. The red flags were there for anyone who wanted to find them. Julie Payette left the Montreal Science Centre and the Canadian Olympic Committee amid complaints she mistreated staff. It was pretty easy for me to find out that she left two past workplaces amid controversy and questions around her treatment of staff there. So why didn't your government ask some pretty basic questions about her ability to leave? And why won't you commit to using a committee to select the next governor general? Uh, as I said, uh, we are looking right now at processes that can be strengthened. Trudeau stuck to that answer no matter how many times he was asked. Obviously, uh, the vetting process that was in place was followed. We will continue to look at uh, the best way to uh, select people for uh, the vice regal appointments. He also didn't apologize to employees who claimed they were verbally abused. We want to thank them uh, for their work and uh, reassure them that we will continue to stand up uh, for uh, workplaces uh, that are safe and secure. The whole mess could have been avoided, say the Conservatives, if Trudeau had have used a nonpartisan committee to pick the Governor General, rather than going with his own personal choice. Is the one who put aside the committee, is the one who decides, I know better than everybody else, he was wrong. CBC News learned today about 100 people took part in the review. It cost close to $400,000. And the report's findings concluded there was a toxic and poisonous workplace culture at Rideau Hall and the Governor General and her secretary were responsible. While Payette may be gone from office, starting today, the government will pay Payette an annuity, an annual salary for the rest of her life, about $150,000 a year. The NDP says that doesn't sit well with Canadians. Anytime there is uh, inappropriate conduct, particularly towards uh, employees, uh, we've got to take a really hard look at uh, or is that behavior being rewarded or is it being discouraged? And, and what do our actions tell uh, the employees? But right now, there's no way for the government to refuse Payette that annuity. It's written into law. All of this meaning the Canadian public will pay for Payette's appointment for the rest of her life, whether they like it or not. Ashley, the people at the heart of this story have been your sources. And how did they react to the Prime Minister's comments today? Well, Ian, with no apology from Justin Trudeau, they said it felt like a missed opportunity, especially since the governor general didn't acknowledge or apologize to staff for the devastating consequences her choices and actions have had. They said that true leadership would have meant condemning what happened and apologizing to Canadians for letting it happen so long. All right, Ashley, thank you very much. The role of the governor general is largely ceremonial, but still crucial to Canadian government. It is the Queen's representative in Canada. And while the Crown has no role in day-to-day -day governing, it's supposed to be a safeguard for democracy. If a Prime Minister wants to prorogue Parliament suspended for a period, they need the Governor-General's permission. Perhaps most importantly, in the rare case where it's not clear one party has the confidence of the majority of Parliament, the Governor-General can offer another party the opportunity to try to form government. 
So here we sit with a minority liberal government and no governor general. After Julie Payette's departure broke with tradition, some Canadians argue it's time to update the post itself and how it's filled. Cameron McIntosh spoke with some of them. So what now? Start here with a small question. Will this remain equal Julie Payette? And I'm glad I don't have to make the decision. I know they'll probably give it a lot of thought. Whatever your views of Payette and her legacy, bigger questions follow. Not just who should replace her, but how they're selected. It's always the Prime Minister's uh, prerogative to, uh, to choose somebody that he has confidence in. Still, says the head of the Monarchist League of Canada, what goes into the Prime Minister's decision should follow a process. In hindsight, uh, a broader, a broader uh, consultation probably would have been beneficial. Even those who would cut Canada's ties to the Crown agree. Picking a head of state should be clear and consistent. We see every changeover from one governor general to another, an opportunity to discuss the selection process, uh, the role and responsibilities. You know, the governor general potentially could be someone who, who holds all aspects of government responsible. Manitoba Grand Chief Arlen Dumas would like to see an Indigenous vice regal. He agrees the 19th century role needs a 21st century rethink. I think it needs to be more inclusive. I think that uh, everyone should have an opportunity to sort of present uh, who, the, who the best candidates would be. With an election, a near-term possibility, Finch says at the very least, this time, opposition leaders should be consulted. They have to have buy-in from everybody on this because, I mean, the Governor General, it's not just about, uh, it's not just about cutting ribbons and uh, planting trees. I mean, she has a very important constitutional role to play, particularly when it's a minority parliament. Whatever process is used in the end, in the interim, the Chief Justice of Canada, Richard Wagner, will serve as Governor General until a replacement is found and sworn in. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. The Prime Minister today also spoke about the fight against COVID-19, trying to reassure Canadians that vaccination plans are still on track, despite recent delays from Pfizer. Justin Trudeau says he's spoken with the CEO himself. The next few weeks will be challenging when it comes to deliveries. That said, Dr. Bourla assured me that hundreds of thousands of Pfizer doses will be delivered the week of February 15th and in the weeks to follow. He said all four million doses ordered should be here by the end of March. Of course, that supply is in high demand, key to every province and territory's battle plan. And as Greg Rasmussen tells us, BC has unveiled one of the most detailed provincial blueprints yet for mass vaccination. 92-year-old Satnam Mon will be one of the first in the general public to get the vaccine, a relief to her son and grandchildren, all living under the same roof. My mother is in her 90s, so obviously she's more vulnerable and uh, we're looking forward to getting her vac vaccinated. The shots will be doled out based on age. More than 4 million people will be asked to register in advance. Each will get a card proving they've been vaccinated. We will utilize our arenas, our convention halls, our community centres to make sure that we can get everyone who wants a vaccination a vaccination. Starting next month, everyone over 80 will be eligible. By April, mass vaccinations for those between 60 to 79 will begin. And finally, in July, those 18 to 59 can get in line for the shot. Many groups have been clamoring for early access. Teachers, for example, today expressed disappointment they won't be an immediate priority. But the government says certain groups or occupations might be given early access as new information emerges. We'll continue to follow uh, the, the science uh, and the data around younger people. Um, but right now, uh, the focus is on protecting those who are most at risk. Vaccinations for vulnerable populations are also more clearly defined under today's plan, all with the goal of reducing fatalities. My most optimistic self says that we'll see a drop in hospitalizations um, and deaths um, within a couple of months. Despite being far down the priority list, today's plan makes sense to 25-year-old Milan Mann. My grandmother, the matriarch of family with you know seven kids and a whole bunch of grandkids, so as long as she's protected, and if I'm lower down on the priority list, that's fine. For all families in BC, the key will be vaccine supplies and whether there's enough to meet the government's timeline. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Langley, BC.
Daily case counts are on the decline, but it's too soon to determine whether Canada is doing enough to conquer this constantly changing second wave. Another sign of the challenge came from the Prime Minister. Our government is deploying two federal mobile health units to the GTA. This will provide up to 200 additional hospital beds and free up space for people who need ICU care. That help for the Greater Toronto Area announced as Ontario reports 2,662 new cases. A month ago, that would have been a record. Now it may seem like a relief. The trend in the seven-day average has been down now for nearly two weeks. But as Ellen Morrow shows us, there is a long way to go. It's heartbreaking. Um, I have to stay strong. Debbie Griggs' mother, Evelyn, lives at Roberta Place, a long-term care home where an as-yet undetermined variant of the virus has helped fuel an explosive outbreak. Nearly every resident, including Griggs' mother, has COVID. 27 people have died. These people paid into years and years and years of social uh, security and we're just leaving them to the side of the road sometimes is how it feels. Just one example of the suffering that continues even as Ontario's daily COVID case count declines. The improvement, a glimmer of hope, nearly a month after an Ontario-wide lockdown began. And if we stay the course, I think that, you know, we can work to make this be the last lockdown that we experience. This week, Ontario's top doctor set a goalpost of around 1,000 new cases a day before lockdown measures can be eased. That's likely too high, says this epidemiologist. The lower number of cases we have, the easier time we will have controlling this. While new cases have dropped, hospitalizations remain at a dangerous level as fears grow over the new variants. Variants are of such concern and you know we could very easily go from 2,500 to 3,000 cases a day to 5,000 cases a day or 10,000 cases a day. There's no rhyme or reason to this virus. Susie Golding contracted COVID at the beginning of the pandemic and still experiences debilitating brain fog and fatigue, leaving her unable to play with her son like she used to. The normal tasks that you can do in a day um, you're looking to try and get done with only a battery that's a third full. Golding imploring others to stay vigilant. People need to understand that this could potentially happen to them and that the best way to, av to avoid it is just to not get the virus. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. New and concerning details are emerging about the coronavirus variant first found in the UK. It's not just more contagious. Christine Birak tells us there is some evidence it could be more lethal. It's not a sure thing, but Britain's Prime Minister is clearly worried. There is some evidence that the new variant, the variant that was first identified in London and the southeast, may be associated with a higher degree of mortality. Studies have already shown this variant spreads more quickly. Evidence is now suggesting it might also be 30 percent more deadly. Now that evidence is not yet strong. It's, it's a series of different bits of information that come together to support that. The studies are small, but UK scientists found there is a realistic possibility that the variant is associated with an increased risk of death, but add the absolute risk of death remains low. British experts suggest for an infected man in his 60s, the average risk of dying was 10 in 1,000. Now, with this variant, it's roughly 13 or 14 in 1,000. This alone does not confirm that the variant is more deadly than other non-variant strains. But some Canadian doctors see those same results very differently. If you don't look at the preliminary data and take it seriously, by the time that data is hard, you could be in a deep world of hurt. He adds while Canada is sequencing just 5% of positive cases to find out if someone was infected with the variant, Denmark is sequencing every case. And despite a strict lockdown, they're finding the genetic fingerprint of the variant in an alarming number of cases. And I think it's wildly optimistic if you think that this variant isn't going to come here and isn't going to have a major impact. 
Current evidence shows vaccines are still effective against this variant, but to keep it at bay, some experts are calling for stricter travel restrictions and urging governments not to let up on public health measures or risk yet another wave of infections. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. And as that variant and others continue to spark concern, the Prime Minister again warned Canadians against vacation travel. We could be bringing in new measures that significantly impede your ability to return to Canada at any given moment without warning. Last night, I had a long conversation with the premiers about a number of different options that we could uh, possibly exercise to uh, further limit travel and to keep Canadians safe. And we will uh, have more to say on those in the coming days. But the bottom line is this, it's not the time to travel. The Quebec premiers openly discussed making returning travelers sit out their two-week quarantines in hotels at their own expense. It's our first exposure to this variant, but it is not unexpected. But it is yet another reason why we are continuing to maintain our numbers of restrictions. Nova Scotia has linked two cases, first identified in December, to the COVID-19 variants from the UK and South Africa. Officials say both involve travel outside of Atlantic Canada, but strict isolation rules appear to have contained the cases. The measures being announced today are stern, but they are necessary. There are now 129 active cases in Zone 4. At the current pace, that number will exceed 200 active cases early next week and potentially 400 active cases before the month is over. Climbing case numbers in a series of outbreaks have pushed officials in New Brunswick to implement a full lockdown in the hard-hit Edmonston region. The move is effective at midnight Saturday and will last 14 days. Who a new U.S. president chooses to call first sends a message. And Joe Biden dialed up Justin Trudeau. On the agenda, Biden's cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline with some premiers urging Trudeau to push back. It, it is an important piece of infrastructure and cancelling it retroactively like we have does have implications. It, it's, it's very frustrating that one of the first acts of the new president was, I think, to disrespect America's closest friend and ally, Canada. So clearly this call was going to be about more than just congratulations. David Cochran is in Ottawa with more on the call. David. Yeah, Ian, I'm told Justin Trudeau voiced his objections over Keystone, but it did not change the president's mind. A uh, source says Biden acknowledged the hardship this would create, but that he was simply fulfilling a campaign promise to restore the original decision to block Keystone that Donald Trump had reversed. Now, on another potential source of tension, that's Biden's Buy American policies, Canada receives some reassurance. Uh, Biden isn't going to turn trade upside down like Trump did, but this does raise fears of protectionism. And Biden said U.S. officials will consult with with Canadian ones as the Buy American policy is finalized. So Canada may not like the outcome, but they will be heard. And, and what about the issues where both leaders might be more in step? You know, the official I spoke with says that Biden represents a return to the America that we know. Many of the priorities are aligned, but, you know, the hard work still lies ahead. And one area where you can expect change is on COVID, that Washington will now finally take this seriously and that the two countries can work together, learn from each other's mistakes and successes. And, and one last point to cover, the two Michaels, Kovrig and Spaver, being detained in China. I'm told Biden showed a very clear awareness of that situation and there's hope for help on that front. Okay, David, thank you. You're welcome. Meanwhile, American lawmakers are pushing forward with the impeachment of the country's former leader. The January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, incited by Donald J. Trump, was a day none of us will ever forget. But healing and unity will only come if there is truth and accountability. The impeachment charge against Donald Trump will be delivered to the Senate on Monday. Arguments will not begin until the week of February 8th, allowing Trump's lawyers two weeks to build a defense. Trump is charged with incitement of insurrection in relation to the riots on Capitol Hill earlier this month. People in the United States and around the world are mourning the loss tonight of one of baseball's greatest players. Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record back in 1974. Now he's being remembered for how he excelled and what he endured. Jamie Strachan has a look at Aaron's legacy. Aaron waiting. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. It is gone. Henry Aaron has eclipsed 
the mark set by Babe Ruth. On the field, Hank Aaron, one of the greatest hitters of all time, let his bat do the talking. No moment bigger than this one. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the deep south. Aaron's Hall of Fame career left an indelible mark on the game's record books. He was an all-star an astounding 25 times. Many of his records still stand today. If people should say, well, what did Hank Aaron do? What, what, what did he mean? You know, I, I think they would say that he did it right. Not everyone cheered Aaron's accomplishments throughout his career. He is one of the greatest players of the all time, if not the greatest, and he still had to go through a lot of racism. Throughout his career, he encountered racist hate mail and multiple death threats that intensified as he approached Babe Ruth's record. It didn't happen 100 or 200 years ago. It happened 50 years ago. He later said the experience carved away a piece of his heart. Aaron did speak candidly about you know, what he had gone through as, as a young person growing up in Jim Crow America in the 1950s. It was said that Muhammad Ali looked upon Henry Aaron as, as one of the most important influences on his own life. Off the field, he led the integration of baseball's front offices and through his charity helped thousands attend college. I hope that the home run is not the only thing that people or anybody for that matter, black or white, look at me and say that's the only thing that he could do. His deep impact was reflected today by those who remembered him, including former President Barack Obama, who said Aaron never missed an opportunity to lead, pointing to his last public appearance when he got his COVID-19 shot. It's difficult for me to stand here and eulogize Hank Aaron because I don't have the words and we don't have enough time. Hank Aaron was 86. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. The IOC says reports the Tokyo Olympics are in jeopardy are false. But Canadian athletes are demanding some answers. I know that they want to have the games that, you know, go ahead at all costs, but I don't want them to go ahead at all costs. And as the virus continues to keep many under lockdown, teens are feeling the impact. Not seeing people, I sometimes forget that how much these people care about me. We'll get some advice on how best to cope. Plus, a young girl is capturing our hearts and the attention of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. We're back in two. Welcome back. A former Canadian Olympic martial arts coach convicted of sex assault has been sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Shin Wook Lim was sentenced this morning following victim impact statements delivered by two of his students. They described the debilitating anxiety in the years since the incidents and how Lim's actions tainted the sport they once loved. We're six months to the scheduled start of the Tokyo Olympics, the pandemic delaying the 2020 Games to 2021. But today, officials were forced to deny reports of a possible cancellation. Aaron Collins looks at the challenges facing the Games and the athletes. It all looks so strange now. A crowded stadium, smiling, maskless faces. The 2016 Olympics seems like another world. Holding the Games this year feels impossible. Not so, according to the IOC. Everybody is uh, really determined to make uh, these Olympic Games in six months uh, from now the light at uh, the end uh, of uh, the tunnel. Despite media reports to the contrary, the Tokyo Games will apparently go on and Canada will be there. The Tokyo 2020 Olympics are an important beacon of hope for our team and we hope for most Canadians and so we're, we're all systems go. A medalist in 2012, Brent Hayden was planning a comeback in Tokyo, but in the midst of a global pandemic, he knows some things are bigger than sport. There are people around the world who are in much worse situations than uh, than my opportunity to go to the Olympics and you know, sort of a couple laps uh, in a pool. So it, it definitely puts things in um, in perspective. Gabriella Debuse Stafford will run for Canada, but she says there's only one way to do that safely. I don't think it's a realistic uh, scenario to have an Olympics 
without a vaccine. But she says athletes shouldn't be vaccinated before vulnerable people. And even if athletes can compete safely, well, they could do it in empty stadiums, making the already risky proposition of hosting the games a financial disaster. When they want to show economic calamities of financial sports, yeah, th this is going to this is going to be on the metal stand. How's that for a good soundbite? If the games do happen this year, some say they could be the last ones held on this scale, replaced by a series of smaller events, ones that carry the Olympic brand, but not the financial risk. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up, the mental health impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 lockdowns. What's the point? No one cares. This is too much. I am not okay. I'll speak with two doctors on best ways to cope. Plus. Potential for failure was, was there and certainly we felt it. Film and TV productions are underway, but it's a risky business. Stay with us. Welcome back. Within the COVID-19 crisis is what's being called a shadow pandemic. A report from Sick Kids Hospital says more young people have eating disorders. Other studies show teenagers are suffering more from anxiety and depression. Deanna Sumanag Johnson spoke with some teens about their struggles and what can help. Daily bike rides with his dad have been a constant in Quincy Raven Jackson's life. But when the pandemic hit last spring, a lot of other things changed for the 19-year-old who was then in the gap year between high school and university. It just was so boring. I had nothing to do. Challenging for any young person, but especially so for one with an anxiety disorder. I have difficulty with like social interaction sometimes. So not seeing people, I sometimes forget that how much these people care about me and stuff like that. So it was very lonely. The loss of connection with friends during the pandemic has taken a hard toll on the mental health of teens and intermittent school closures have taken away many of the things that give them joy and confidence. The extracurriculars is what really makes school school. 16-year-old Serena Sri, who is also dealing with anxiety, says she misses her dance classes the most. Online classes, she says, just didn't feel the same. Not having that escape is tough and um, losing something that I love so much and passionate about is really tough. Of course, getting teens to talk about what they're going through is not easy, even in the best of times. So this child psychologist came up with an idea, asking kids and teens to put their feelings into artwork. The result is an online exhibit called Child Art. Some of the words that the kids have used in their artwork is, what's the point? No one cares. This is too much. I am not okay. Broken, right? Just feeling broken. Dr. Nikki Martin says parents can help by fostering conversation and showing their own vulnerability. To normalize that it's okay to not be okay now. Serena and Quincy say they're both lucky to have good relationships with their parents as they keep moving on the long road of life ahead of them, even if right now it seems like they're standing still. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in Dr. Nikolai White, a family physician in Toronto, and Dr. Shimmy Kang, a psychiatrist and associate professor at UBC and parenting author. She joins us from Vancouver. I want to hear from both of you on this first question and starting with Dr. Kang, if I may. What impact are you seeing in your practice on kids? Right, Ian. So I think I'm seeing very similar to what's been called the K-shaped recovery of the pandemic. I'm seeing that in my practice and in mental health too. There is a small segment, that top arm of the K, that are actually doing better. Um, these are kids that may have been overscheduled, sleep deprived. They're having dinner at home with their families instead of in a car being shuffled to an activity. Um, they're talking about greater connections um, with their loved ones uh, and they're less busy. So that's one arm, but the bigger arm is that down end of the K. These are vulnerable youth who may have pre-existing mental health issues. One in four of all Canadians, uh, adolescent brain is the most sensitive. 
uh, kids with concussion history or trauma histories or marginalized communities, poverty already. And they are really suffering in this pandemic. We're seeing increased rates of anxiety, depression, video game addiction, increased use of screen time, which can be very negative, including a upticks in cyberbullying um, and across the board. So, I, so we're definitely seeing both. It's not all doom and gloom, but there's a very large percentage that we have to be very concerned about. And, and Dr. White, as a family physician, you kind of see this uh, on the on the intake level in your practice. What are you seeing? Yeah, so we're seeing that kids don't have the same access to extracurricular activities that they normally would. And I think, you know, that's something we took for granted growing up, being able to participate in organized sports, music classes, and even important milestones like graduations. These things are now canceled and we don't have a really good solution for them. Um, as Dr. Kang alluded to, the increase in screen time isn't necessary, necessarily a fix to this problem. And so it's a matter of finding ways to get kids engaged in other extracurricular activities that often they have to do by themselves. So it is a big challenge and it's, it's something we're working towards solving. And I think it underscores why we're hearing from so many public health doctors about the importance of keeping kids in school as much as possible, you know, given COVID safety. Uh, Dr. White, I assume you're an advocate of, of trying to keep kids in school. Yeah, it's important. Uh, I worry about long-term consequences of kids being at home. We don't want to see this impacting their long-term growth and development because the longer they stay at home, the longer they're isolated, they're missing out on those key life experiences, the ability to learn how to develop relationships, how to develop social skills, how to develop self-confidence. And so it is a priority for all of us and we're doing our best uh, and we're, we're working as hard as we can to keep our kids in school. I think we have to make that a huge priority. Well, let's talk about advice, uh, Dr. Kang. I'll start with you. I would tell young people that, first of all, your brain is not broken. It is unfinished. Um, there's a lot going on, and this can be a very tough time. But we know what can work. Routine, regular sleep, exercise, outdoor, sunlight, exposure, positive social connection, play, your hobbies, recreation is recreate. So do all those things consistently. If you can't, you might need help. You might need some vitamin D or a sun lamp or a therapist or even medication. So get that help. Dr. White? Yeah, uh, I have similar suggestions. I think physical activity is, is always important. 30 minutes a day, get outdoors, go for a walk, ride your bike. Uh, an artistic endeavor would be a recommendation as well. Being engaged, you do have a community out there and everyone is going through a similar challenge. So feel free and make sure you're reaching out to your social network to keep, keep that intact as well. And Dr. Kang, one very quick follow-up. Are people taking all of this seriously? Are they engaging, for example, with psychiatrists? You know, I, I hope they are. Um, and I want to just make it clear. We definitely need psychiatrists, but there's family doctors, there's school counselors, there's teachers, there's sports coaches. You know, it really is a community approach. Um, so I'm so thankful that programs like this are talking about mental health. Uh, we really need to help this current generation to move and get into that course correction. And some are learning skills that are going to be so helpful for the rest of their lives. And we're thankful for your guidance, uh, Dr. Kang, Dr. White. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Coming up, we head to Canada's north, where the fear over COVID can be existential. It's scary. Well, it takes the whole community. And as vaccines arrive, more challenges arise. We're back right after this. For the first time in nearly a month, Nunavut has recorded a new case of COVID-19. The government says the person is asymptomatic and self-isolating, and there's no evidence of community transmission. Still, it does underline the urgency to get vaccines to remote areas where healthcare resources aren't as robust. In the Northwest Territories, vaccine teams have arrived in 16 isolated communities so far. But as the CBC's Kate Kyle reports, even once the shots are there, it's not always straightforward. Okay, this picture is my, um, my, my family. For Madeline Judas, family is everything. Her 88-year-old mother is the matriarch. Don't at the Hindi. With cases of COVID-19 surging in the south, Judas worries about the pandemic reaching all the way here to Wekwiti. 
The Klichong community of about 150 people is only accessible by plane most of the year. It's scary. Well, it takes the whole community. I was thinking like that. Such fears are real in small, tightly knit communities of the north. That's why vaccine teams are fanning out across the Northwest Territories with enough doses of the Moderna vaccine for anyone 18 and older willing to get it. But transporting and storing this cargo isn't easy. Neither is getting the vaccine into people's arms. They're believing about like people could die from it or like allergic reactions. Uh, a lot of people my age, they're talking about like they don't want to take it. Social media falsehoods are contributing to vaccine hesitancy even here. <laughs> to prove it's safe, chiefs are among the first to be vaccinated against COVID-19. It's getting worse and it's getting worse all across the whole world. So with that shot, we might get lucky to save our lives. So. Another challenge, colonialism has left many people mistrusting of government. In the community of Sigacek, familiar faces helped. Regional nurses who visit regularly gave out the first doses. My siblings and my brother and sister-in-law, so we all got it at the same time. The territory's medical director says the government is trying hard to allay people's fears. Uh, I think it's also important to acknowledge some of the negative interactions that many of our communities have had with the healthcare system. So we've done uh, translations of written materials into the 11 uh, official languages of the Northwest Territories. Uh, there's been radio ads that have gone out, door-to-door uh, -door, uh, campaigns, and we've really tried also to use uh, language-speaking healthcare professionals who are able to translate the consent form. <laughs> Lena Dragis is doing that in Dilo, a Dene community neighboring Yellowknife. So it's a lot easier for us to explain things to them. We take our time. But there are some words that just don't translate. One elder was asking about what's in that little bottle there, he said. And I said, I don't know, they just call it vaccine. Back in Wekwiti, Madeline Judas is relieved to get her first dose. I feel good that uh, I protect myself from the disease. Officials hope her positive experience will help convince more people to get the shot when vaccine teams fan out again next month. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Wekwiti, Northwest Territories. In the United Kingdom, the vaccination effort is approaching a milestone. Nearly six million doses have been administered there. Many of them have been delivered in unique locations, including historic Salisbury Cathedral. Renee Filipponi went there to talk with those looking for a shot of the vaccine and a shot of hope. In a place where some come to find hope in dark times, the promised light at the end of the tunnel is being offered, shot by shot. Nearly a thousand a day are inoculated here. What does it mean to you now that you've had that first vaccine? It'll take a time, I'm sure, but I think it's the only way out, isn't it now? The elderly who wait their turn have all been invited by their doctors. We've done some searches on all our patient roles um, or lists and we've identified all the over 80s and selectively gone from the oldest age first. Healthcare workers are also invited and as of this week, those over 70 and the clinically vulnerable are too. There are 17 mass vaccination clinics like this across England. The government is taking advantage of empty space, utilizing churches, food courts, sports centers and even race courses. I feel quite, um, you know, kind of um, proud because I say that as a Brit who thinks that we haven't necessarily um, excelled in the pandemic. The UK was the first Western country to approve a vaccine. This immunologist says the success comes from the early start and that the government has put money and muscle behind the vaccination effort. But as the third national lockdown drags on, he worries pressure to reopen could ruin everything especially with the new and more transmissible variants. And have a sort of small segment of partially vac vaccinated population and decide to go out into the streets and party and ease lockdown and be right back where we started. A real fear for those arriving for their shot today. Many have been living in isolation since the spring. The organ plays for them and the exhausted healthcare workers. What might help both groups, but some soothing, beautiful music played in these marvelous surroundings. 
A sense of calm in the midst of a pandemic that's taking a record number of lives in the UK. Rene Filipponi, CBC News, Salisbury, England. Coming up, the pandemic means the demand for streaming content is through the roof. But making film and television has become tricky. We had to do our own touches. Um, we had to do our own props. Next, we get a first-hand look at what COVID safety looks like on set. was originally billed as a 2020 blockbuster has been postponed for a third time. The latest James Bond flick will now debut in October, a delay that once again being blamed on the pandemic. So you might not be going to the theater anytime soon, but of course streaming from home is more popular than ever. And with most productions in California shut down due to COVID, Canada's film crews are in high demand. Eli Glasner takes us on set to see how they're coping with COVID. Surprise! What's this? If you're tuning in to the new season of your favorite Canadian show, you'd never know it was shot under COVID conditions. Everybody had to be more focused. We had to do our own touches. Um, we had to do our own props. Murdoch Mysteries was one of the first shows back behind the camera. The potential for failure was was there, and certainly we felt it. Just pull back to here. We'll Behind serve. the scenes, crews adapted to the new layers and precautions. And having plastic all around us and having to wipe everything down in between people, it added like a good 10 minutes to every makeup that was done in my chair. Testing and distance kept outbreaks at bay, but there was another factor. It's exhaustive. It is. And, and I understand the frontline workers do it all the time. I don't know that they get any more used to it than we ever will. On his movie sets, this producer created a new position to help cast and crew deal with stress. But without insurance for outbreaks, his own anxiety remained high. Every time the phone rang, I was like, is there a COVID incident? Is somebody sick? Is what's going on, right? Are we going to have to shut down? While he debates whether to move forward on his future projects. It's an ongoing question of, you know, what is our moral responsibility? Should we be bringing people back to work or should we be waiting, should we be waiting for the numbers to start going down? But he better decide soon. With the virus raging in California and shutting down parts of Hollywood, Productions are racing north and business is booming in Ontario and B.C. You know, the phone hasn't stopped ringing. There's a tremendous amount of calls coming in for studio space. You know, that's why we expanded to the airport facilities. You know, we needed more space. Detective Murdoch. He's a detective. The competition for resources is putting some Canadian productions at a disadvantage. But as the pandemic stretches on, one thing hasn't changed. It's the need for entertainment. It's the need for something to watch and for content. Uh, certainly, our voices on our screens. I'm not a little scared. Providing entertainment and escape when audiences need it most. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, a violin and a virtual contest. The nine-year-old who steals the show next in our moment. <laughs> Listening to Chelsea Goo play the violin, you'd never know the nine-year-old has only been playing for two years. Her dad suggested she enter a virtual challenge started by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. So she did, and she's one of the youngest contestants, and she's our moment. Hi, I'm Jonathan Crow, here with Phil Chu to play a little bit of Bach's Violin Concerto for Two Violins with you. This challenge was kind of a chance for us to reach out to anybody that plays an instrument and give them a chance to kind of do something with, with me. the challenge and when I heard about it I was really really excited to play with Jonathan. It's not hard, it's not easy, it's in the middle. She's kind of amazing. It's like oh, I was impressed at the time and when I heard that she was nine it's even more impressive. She's great um, and I don't think people realize how hard it is 
not only to play the violin, but to play along with somebody else who has already recorded the piece. In the future, I hope I'm going to be playing in the TSL. And I want to spread joy to the other people who are listening to my music. There is too much amazing about that moment to really do it justice in the 15 seconds I have, other than to say she's amazing, her poise is incredible, and really a win for the TSO as well at this time during COVID to uh, get the publicity they're getting for that contest. That is the National for January 22nd. I hope you can join me on Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio 1. That begins at 4 p.m. Eastern, and then later that evening back here on the National. Good night.